Hey guys, DMike here for another episode of Pokemon Brilliant Diamond. Who's ready to put the pedal to the metal? I'm not really entirely sure how cool you can be riding a bike, but we're going to show the world how cool we can be. So if you'll walk through here, you're going to see one of Professor Rowan's aides is actually Don's dad. Not an absent father, hasn't gone for milk and cigarettes. And if we show them that we've seen quite a few, actually, we get a prize. A rare candy. Great. Always love taking candy from strangers, especially when they offer it to you out of a van. So that's great. So this is already information we already know. Thank you, Don's dad, for the tutorial. So here we are on Route 206, this is Cycling Road. Well, this game version. Also, I'm not entirely sure like what this is. Like these are like weird ramps. These almost look like steps. Like, who, who puts steps on a place where you're supposed to ride your bike? I also love the dichotomy of the fact that we have like a, like a kid's bike. And this person's riding a bike that you would have in like a triathlon. That's fair. And also, we are still equipped in our bike gear. It's a very nice addition to the aesthetic. I think that's kind of cool. So let's go ahead and intimidate each other first. Why not? I'm actually going to want to spend some time and get Craig involved in these fights. The goal is to catch him up a little bit. The experience all will help, but, you know, obviously... As we've learned, physically having him in the battles is more preferable. Get some more levels. Hope you guys are enjoying this content. If you are, liking the videos is always super cool. Commenting on the videos even cooler. Subscribing, probably the coolest thing you could do. So Cyclist Megan is going to send out her shanks. I don't want any of that bad boy. No need for a mirror match here. Craig definitely is going to probably be the star of the show again. Also, I think it's a, a pretty hilarious that something like Shanks, as goofy and kind of cute as it looks, its ability is Intimidate. I mean, look at it. Wouldn't you be intimidated by that cute face? Maybe it's big yellow eyes. Okay. So I didn't realize that was going to happen. Never mind. We'll switch out. I forgot that Craig is not ground type. So that was gonna be doing a doozy. Actually, most of my type typing on my team is not great for fighting against electricity, but that will change. No worries. I have some plans in mind for future team members that I'm gonna try to mix it up. It would probably actually make the most sense to put Craig in the pole position. The numero uno spot. That way I can swap out because right now Craig is not really in fighting shape. And actually it wouldn't hurt to toss a potion his way. I always remember it as a kid playing through the original red, blue, yellow. And in that game there is a huge strip of cycling road that takes you all the way from the west side of Celadon City once you move the Snorlax out of the way, spoilers, to down to where um, I believe Fuchsia City is. It's on the west side of both. And I think it's really cool how that part of the game is I mean like I didn't understand the mechanic at first of of there being gravity because everything looks flat you know it's a 2d kind of isometric game and I'm watching it and I'm thinking like how on earth am I doing this and why am I having to fight the forces of gravity but I also think it's cool is that in that game 
A lot of the trainers that are on that route specifically, that are like bikers and stuff, they have sprites as trainers where they're holding whips, which I believe was only in that game. And I was watching something earlier that was talking about how in the original Pokemon games, instead of badges you're going to collect, you were going to collect belts, like karate belts, white belt, blue belt, yellow belt. Asteroid Belt, all of those things. And you would, in turn, as you got stronger and more advanced, you would use your belt, and that would be your way of kind of cracking the whip on your Pokemon, literally. Treating it like a whip. And that's why some of those trainer sprites allegedly have whips, is because that was a kind of a precursor to the game being a little more child-friendly. I mean, I would say a lot more child-friendly. It's really interesting if you kind of go back and you read through some of those kind of origin stories of the design of Pokemon. And obviously, it's going to be different because it's being produced by people from the Japanese market who culturally are going to see things differently than we do. There's definitely less sensitivity in terms to like sexuality and you know the graphicness and violence and all those things. There's definitely a different perspective on how they view things versus how we view things. So I think it's really interesting on the things that they had that they wanted to put into the game that didn't even make it from their end. You know, in this case, having whips that you would use to beat your Pokemon into submission. That didn't even make it into the Japanese game, which is, I would say their market is more relaxed and kind of permissible for the things that they allow in, in their content. I mean, go out there at some point, you can just Google websites and there are certain things that are okay for the Japanese market that will not be okay in the Western market, that before it even reaches North America, or I guess Europe, maybe more North America than Europe, especially the United States, just to be clear. And there's a lot of changes that get put into games that maybe you wouldn't necessarily expect. And I don't know if that's because it's a cultural thing where the content of games is just too inappropriate for the American market. Like, we just can't handle it with our sensitive American smooth brains. Or if they're things that wouldn't necessarily translate. Now, I don't mean literally translate because you can take a game which has a ton of dialogue, in this case, an RPG like this, and you can have it basically say whatever you want. You can translate it from Japanese into English and you know as long as it's not you're not trying to be too literal about it because tran trans uh, translating I can't even say that word translating languages is more nuanced than just having a word and swapping it out for another word but you know it's culturally significant in certain ways that when you take a game from one language to another, you have to consider the implications on what you're doing. And I think it's really interesting that there's actually teams of people out there, you know, professionally, this is what they do, is they have to find ways to make the culturally significant things from one language make sense for another market. And I don't mean that in the sense of, you know, trying to square peg round whole Japanese culture and to try to make that make sense for Western audiences. There are certain instances where that does happen, but in the grand scheme of what is going on, it's more kind of in tune with trying to find something that's kind of synonymous, that makes sense in Japanese culture, and then try to include that in Western culture. I guess a good example of that that comes to mind when I think of trying to do that sort of stuff is the Phoenix Wright games. Those games have a ton of references, and a lot of it is Japanese culture. The game itself obviously is set in like Japanifornia or whatever it is, which I think is really funny. 
But there's a lot of moments where you have... The game itself is clearly making a reference to something Japanese. But they just try to kind of hand wave it away and say, Oh, nope, this is actually California or wherever it is. This is the total normal thing that happens everywhere in the world. When in reality, no. Like, you you look at it and you'll be like, No, I don't, I don't think that that does happen. Like, I've never personally seen that happen. So, it's interesting. I think that it's cool that there is a an entire occupation where I'm gonna go ahead and not use takedown takedown kind of sucks um, there's an entire occupation where that's what you do like you go through and you obviously have to be really good at linguistics you obviously have to be really good at knowing Japanese or whatever language like it doesn't have to be Japanese like whatever your starting language is you have to be really well versed in that or know somebody who is who can kind of give you the very literal version of what they're reading. And then hopefully they also understand the cultural significance of it too. And then that gives you the chance to kind of take that and then run with it in a way that you can kind of create your own story without distancing yourself from kind of the original. Cause I mean, if I wrote something really great and I was making, oh boy, it's gonna suck. No, oh, Craig hanging in there. If I wrote something really great and I wanted it to be produced in multiple languages, it depends upon kind of the significance of the story. Like so maybe if it's like written work, it could be something that is meant to stay literal, like where it's like whatever you said in language one, it's meant to be said in language two. But I think a big part of language is the fact that culture is a huge factor in what we do. And there's going to be plenty of moments when I'll be playing a game and I'll be reading through it, and I'm just thinking to myself, like, was this made for American audiences? Like, a good example of a game like that is, uh, I was playing it not too long ago. Um, it's kind of an indie, I'm not sure if this is, I wouldn't say cult classic, it hasn't been out that long, but I was playing a game recently for Switch, and I don't know if I want to name the name of the game or not, I'm not trying to, like, throw shade on it or anything, but, uh, I was playing a game, and it was developed by a Chinese studio. And a lot of the game itself is made in a way that I don't know if it necessarily is trying to be overtly Chinese. I mean, I think that it is because in certain cases there's uh, religious references, there's cultural references, iconography, different things in the game that if you aren't familiar with kind of Chinese culture, it can be kind of lost on you. Now, it's not super important to be able to understand the game. You don't have to play through the game. And if you don't understand those things, it's not like you're gonna miss out. But there are plenty of moments where I'm not well-versed in Chinese culture or anything like that. But I mean, over time and you know, through your education or just through popular culture, you kind of pick up on those things. And you'll, you'll read through that stuff or you'll like look at it and you'll be like, okay, like I get it from the perspective of like it existing and being a thing that is in, in the world, but the nuance of it is just not there. And so I'll see that. And I mean, for all intents and purposes, uh, I could just be a big old dumb. We're not gonna learn Roar because Roar is stupid. I could be a big old dumb and maybe it's the nuance that's lost on me where I'll see certain things in, in, in said games and I'll be looking at it and I'm just like, what on earth is happening right now? And you know, fixing flat tires, my brain feels like a flat tire sometimes. The, <laughs> this episode is just gonna be a monologue, I guess. The, the amount of effort that goes into writing a game and to making something good has to be astounding. Like as, as a content producer, most of the stuff that I do takes you know, oh boy, this is probably gonna knock Craig out. Oh boy. I did not know that that Pikachu had that. That is uncool. I wanna see if I maybe have a revival type item. Something to, yeah, I don't really have a good way to handle electric types, especially considering that the only ground move I have is on a water type. That's kind of a, not the best. I do not have anything for revival. So unfortunately Craig is not gonna get a lick of this experience. It's okay. But anyway. As a content producer, like, 
making a, a script or writing something for a video, putting something together, it's really important to me, I would say, to be the kind of person who, when I make content, that hopefully people understand what I'm going for. I mean, if you're trying to be intentionally confusing and like subversive, then I guess it sort of makes sense that if your viewer or your audience is confused, then hey, clap, clap, success. But to have your work be understood in a way that a lot of people can can see and enjoy, I think that it's kind of meaningful to to feel like the investment of the time that you put into writing it and developing it and all that nonsense that you want it to be intelligible. You want it to like, and this is obviously like people that are hopefully writing good scripts, like for things that people enjoy. So it just makes me think that the amount of time that has to go into making something in your own native tongue or your own native language, and you're putting something together and how tough it's got to kind of be. What is the button for bike? There it is. It's minus. That the amount of stuff you just have to know, like you just have to kind of be in the know to really fully get something. And there's nothing saying that if you don't fully get something that you're going to miss out or that it's going to ruin your experience. But there will be plenty of times when I'm, oh, that was cycling road. Oh, that was like 10 battles. That's pretty good. Let's see what this lady it looks like BB. Oh, she likes our bike, so we get some stickers. Thanks. Kind of feels like one of those kids' bikes you would see hanging up on the rack and maybe a Toys R Us. Rest in peace, Toys R Us. Please don't sue me, Toys R Us. Huh, you probably can't. So, the amount of effort that goes into like the references that are made in certain games, especially like RPGs, because they're very text heavy. So there's a lot of dialogue and exposition that gets written for those games. And I think it's really interesting that you have so much that goes into those games that they're just any work of art really but specifically in this case rpgs because we're talking about a game that's being played is how how tough it has to be to be the kind of person that has to like craft that for another audience because that game i was referring to it was made primarily i'm assuming initially for a chinese audience and i'm reading through it and there's just so much of it that as a westerner I just don't get and maybe that's just because I'm stupid I don't know but I'm just reading through a lot of this and from a surface level it makes sense I get it I'm like okay that's what that is but then there will be moments when there will be certain characters that do certain things or activities that they participate in and I will look at it and I'm just thinking to myself like what on earth are they doing because it feels like there's a disconnect I feel kind of lost and that to me is kind of, and I don't know if I'd say that's, oh, I'm stuck. I don't know if I would say that's necessarily, you know, that's not bad writing per se, but, you know, as a person who doesn't understand a ton of Eastern culture, for those of you that are watching, maybe you do and kudos for you, but it's a little frustrating when I'm reading into something and I get it on a very basic level as somebody who, you know, has not been locked in a cave for their entire life yet. You don't know what I'm into, but it can just be a little frustrating that you'll get to a moment in a game or a movie or something where there's supposed to be like something impactful or maybe it's something that's even even something small. That is a hard, hard rock snake. And I'm going to shoot my goo all over the snake. Oh, yeah, you bet I am. Yeah, those moments, they just don't quite land. And I always wonder I mean, that information is not going to get back to the people who made the game. I don't think that the developers are reaching out to casuals. I mean, maybe they do have like focus groups and test markets and stuff like that to kind of get feedback along the way. But I'm just thinking to myself that I wish I could enjoy it to the fullest. I wish that I could go and participate and experience the entirety of those moments and not be super confused now once again this could just be me maybe those moments are incredibly intelligible and 100 percent clear and i'm just not the smartest and so that leads me to 
things being a little lost in translation. But maybe that happens to other people. And some of it could be the fact that I don't understand culturally what I'm reading. But then there could also be parts of it that are just not good writing. There could be parts of it that maybe the reference itself is kind of a deep cut for the people who wrote it. And I think that there's nothing wrong with having things that are kind of that might go over the average person's head. But it also depends on your market. It depends on your target audience, who you're going after, who you want to participate in your content. You know, if you want to make things that are more permissible for the average person, then you have to write things a certain way. So we got a burn heal. It's a new item. Prevents burns. Crazy. Well, it doesn't prevent them. It heals them. That was dumb. And we have a raspberry. And a blueberry. Blah. Raspberry. The actual fruit of raspberries are delicious to eat. And in their liquid form. Especially when they're old. So we've got ourselves a poison barb. Burb. I like, I love the way people say the name barb. Especially when it's like, hey, what's your name? Oh, your name's Burb. So I don't know what accent that is, but I do like it. Okay. So we do have this very spoopy cave here. But that's actually something that we're going to tackle next time. So thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks for listening to this ridiculous monologue about linguistics and culture. I'll see you guys next time. This has been Pokemon Brilliant Diamond. I've been D-Mike. Have a good one, everybody. Bye.